for this webinar because we're going to be using Perfect Enhance. I'm going to be working with Perfect Photo Suite 8 as a standalone, which means that I'm using it just like any other application. I opened it up straight out of my dock here on my Mac computer. So if you're working on an Apple computer, you have a dock and you can place the Perfect Photo Suite there. You can open it from your applications folder. If you're working on a Windows, it's slightly different. You're going to go to your start menu and access your applications from there. But you just open it up the way you would open up Lightroom or Aperture or Photoshop. And it drops you immediately here into a program called Perfect Browse. And this is a way for you to find images that you're looking to edit. One of the reasons why I'm using this as a standalone today is because Perfect Enhance is a really wonderful tool for basic edits and fixing common issues that you might run into with photography. And it's a tool that's similar that you may find in other applications. So I like to use the suite again as a standalone because I like to show off the capabilities that Enhance and the program itself have. If you'd like to use Perfect Enhance as a plugin for Lightroom, Aperture, or Photoshop, or Photoshop Elements, you can always do that. Um, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how to plug in the Photo Suite in those applications, you can take a look at training videos. But for, for today's webinar, we're just going to be sticking with this here. Now, I want to start out by talking about some of these common photography problems that you're going to run into. We have exposure issues. It's a really good example of an exposure issue. We have a foreground that's very dark, that's very much in shadow, and we have a very bright background where the sky is. It's pretty well exposed, but if we just went through and upped the exposure for this image, we would completely ruin everything. So this is an exposure problem that a lot of people are going to run into. We also have color correction issues, and there are lots of different kinds of color correction issues. There's ones that involve people. We've got this kind of greenish hue that's happening on our photo that looks really bad. And it makes her skin look kind of sallow and almost jaundiced because it's really yellow. That's not so good. And then you'll also run into color correction problems that are more on inanimate objects. So while this may have been taken during the day, maybe it was in shadow and it didn't automatically color correct itself. And so again, it has kind of a weird coloring to it a little cyan, a little hazy. One of the last kind of big problems that I think we run into as a whole are photos that have distractions or, or photos that have issues. So this is also a really good example of a photo that has power lines in it. The image itself is one that I might really like. Maybe I took this and I remember where I took this. I took this in a small town here in Oregon and while I absolutely loved the River Cafe, which used to be open, and uh, I went back 10 years later and it was closed, I wanted to take this nice big picture and there were power lines that were obstructing the view. So we've got an issue here that unfortunately we can't really get rid of just by changing things like exposure, color correction, and so on. So there are lots of different problems that we run into as photographers when we're out shooting. And one of the last ones that I want to mention are just kind of dull photos flat images that you remember taking the photo and it looked great and then you see it on your computer and it's just flat. Uh, this was taken actually on the side of that building we were just looking at, the River Cafe in Oregon. And the paint chips and the peeling walls and all of that grit and dirt, I remember it in person. It was great. And now that I'm actually looking at the image itself on the screen, I'm not really liking it anymore. It doesn't have that same grunginess. It doesn't have that same intensity that I remember seeing in person. And this is kind of one of those last things that I think happens when you're out shooting and you're not always paying attention. I'm the kind of person who runs around and just takes pictures and forgets to pay attention to things like exposure and color correction. So I run into this problem a lot where I end up with photos that are a little flat. Um, so those are kind of the main ones that we're going to be talking about today and we'll go over each one of them here. Now let's start out and let's talk about Let's talk about exposure. So we've got this image. The exposure is completely wrong. We need to take this in and fix it. Now, when you're working in the program as a standalone and you've got your photo ready to edit, you're going to go up on the top right hand corner of your screen and click on the module that you'd like to go into. So just select which program you'd like to, you'd like to enter into. So we'll click on enhance and then it's going to ask me whether I'd like to edit my original file because this is a PSD 
whether I'd like to edit a copy of my original file. If you're working with raw images, like so many of you probably do, it will automatically choose to edit a copy of your original image. And I always recommend selecting that option, even if you shoot in JPEG, because you don't want to destroy your original photo. You also have copy options down at the bottom where you can select things like file format, color space, bit depth, and resolution. So you can be very specific down here, and this is how your photo will save out when you're finished and enhanced. So it's kind of like preemptive saving information here. So I'm going to keep it as a Photoshop file. I've got all of my other options set and I'll click OK. Now, a basic tour of Enhance as a whole. On the right-hand side, we have our Quick Fixes pane. This is where you're going to find very simple, very basic adjustments like auto levels, which will set the white and black points of your image. If I click this, it's not really going to do much to this photo because the exposure is kind of hard to work with right now. So if you click an auto button and you don't like it, you can always just turn it off. There's also an auto color button, which will try and set the tint and the temperature for you. We can turn that on and you'll see it's already pulling out that kind of horrible cyan blue that's happening on this image. And then we have six basic adjustments, brightness, contrast, vibrance, temperature, detail, and vignetting. Just by clicking on the plus or the minus buttons, you can lighten or darken, you can add or subtract contrast, you can add or subtract vibrancy if you want to pump up the color in the image, you can adjust the overall temperature, so if I just want it to be a little bit warmer, or maybe I want it to be a little bit cooler, I can scoot that around. I can add or subtract detail, which can be really nice if you want to crisp up the edges in the image, and then you can also add a very simple vignette, whether it be light or dark. Now, for the advanced adjustments, this is where we want to go for an image like this one. Just by clicking the brightness button, even if I move it over, the image is getting lighter, but one of the things that you're going to notice is that the background is now getting blown out. So if we push the brightness over too far, we lose all of the background information, even though the foreground is looking quite a bit better. So you kind of have to balance how blown out that, that sky is going to look with how bright the forward section of the image, the front part of the image is going to look. So by going down to the color and tone adjustments, we've got a couple of extra enhancements that we can make to fix this problem that we're running into. So I'm going to take the brightness slider and I'm going to move it over a little bit, but not too much, maybe to about 15 or so. Then I'm going to go underneath and you'll see that there are shadows and highlight sliders. These recover the shadows that are too dark or the highlights that are too light in your photo. So if I move the shadow slider over to the right, all of a sudden that foreground is getting lighter. And we're pulling in much more information in the foreground, but we're making sure that the sky remains nice and bright. Now, just in case the sky is a little too bright, you can also move the highlight slider over to the right. And it'll darken it just enough that we can get a little bit more color information and saturation in the top part of the image. Another really good way to make sure sometimes what can happen is you end up with a photo that looks just a little flat, if you will, when you increase the shadow and highlight detail. I like to go in and add just a little bit of contrast because then you can maintain some of the blacks and some of the whites without going overboard. And then the last slider that I like to play around with down here is the detail slider. This adds contrast to the fine details in the image. It's very similar to tonal contrast, which I'm betting a lot of you are familiar with. And as I move it over to the right, it's just going to, again, make sure that all those details look nice and crisp. We're not losing any information. We don't have any added haze on the photo. Now, the color section, again, we can always try and automatically adjust it if we'd like to. It did a really good job of doing that on its own. If I need to manually adjust it, I can, but my favorite slider is the vibrant slider. I like my images to have a nice, I like them to have very bright saturated colors. And so I like to take my vibrant slider and move it over to the right quite a bit. And it's not overdoing this photo too much. It's mostly just adding some vibrance to the sky and then to some of the information like the, the rust colors in the rocks and some of the aquas that are in the, the lake right here. 
Now, the last thing that I would do to finish this image off is that a very simple vignette. You have some presets up at the top, like Subtle, which is usually the one that I like to use. It just adds a very simple, soft vignette right at the edges. You can also go and apply a strong one, which is much more intense, or the edges, which creates more of this kind of border style effect. You can also always go down and make adjustments in the advanced section too. So if you want to change things like maybe you'd like to darken the edges just a bit more, or maybe you'd like to pull it out further away from the center. One of the options that I really like is changing the size or the style of the vignette itself. And a good way to see what that roundness slider is doing, and this is the way that I apply almost all of my vignettes, is I take my size slider and I leave it kind of right in the middle, and then I take my feathering slider, which adjusts the hardness of the edge of your vignette, and I move it all the way to zero. It shows me exactly what shape I'm applying to my image. And then when I take my roundness slider and I move it, you can tell that I can get a spotlight effect. I can get more of an oval effect, or then I'll make it a little bit smaller. I can actually change it into a rectangle. So I like to pull that feathering down so that I can figure out what size and style I want my vignette to be before I up the feathering amount. It gives me a much better indication of where that vignette's going to lay down when I finish it off. So I like to push it out so that it's just right at the edges there, and then we'll add that feathering back in. Now once I'm done, I've gone through and I've edited everything I need to, the last thing that I would finish this photo off with is making sure that I've got all the little spots and areas like dust spots or distractions or anything like that. I want to make sure that those are gone. We've got two very small little dust spots that you can see in the sky and then in this mountain in the background. And we have two different retouching tools that you can use. My favorite is the Perfect Eraser, and it's a content aware fill tool that kind of smart fills the areas that you paint over. It's very, very helpful. So we'll go ahead and select the perfect eraser and we'll make the brush just a little bit smaller and click and drag over those little dust spots that are there. Now we're pretty much done. So I always like to take a look at my before and after. It gives me a better idea of the, the changes that I've been making on my images. A really cool little tidbit when you're working with before and afters, if you click the tab key on your keyboard, it hides the left and right hand panels so that you get more of a full screen view of your image. Then you can press Control or Command P on your keyboard. This is the original image that we started out with. This was almost entirely straight out of camera. It was sized and resaved as a PSD file, but this is pretty much what was shot when the image was taken. And this is our after image. We've lightened it up. We've pulled a little bit more information out of all of those rocks in the foreground, but we maintained a nice dark sky. We fixed those little spots that were distracting, and we added a very subtle vignette to kind of pull in the center where the sun is going down. So flat, boring, not a very good exposure, much more interesting, color balanced, image. Now when you're done, we'll click that tab key one more time to bring back those panels on the left and the right. Just go down to the bottom right hand corner and click save and close. It's going to go in, it's going to apply all of those effects that we just added and it's going to drop me back into browse. What's wonderful is my original image and my after image, my final photo, are right next to each other. When you're working through the program as a standalone, it pulls the name information from your original image. So the original is called Tahoe, and it just adds the word copy at, at the end. So now it's Tahoe and then Tahoe copy. So original image, final image. Now let's talk about color. Um, this image was pretty easy to color correct. It did it automatically on its own, and that's fantastic. But what happens when you have an image that's a little bit more finicky or maybe has a person in it, which can cause some issues? 
So we've got this photo here. We'll go ahead and place it in Enhance. And we'll create a copy there. Now, sometimes the auto color buttons aren't going to work very well. I click the auto color button here and it doesn't really know what it's looking for. And the image itself is so green that it can't quite figure out what we want to do. And the subject is red and then obviously has kind of a paler skin. And neither of those are very good for trying to figure out how to color correct it because red and red and skin tones can be very finicky colors to deal with as a whole. So we're going to turn that auto color off there and scroll down to the color and tone adjustments pane to the color section. On the bottom left, we have an eyedropper tool, and this is where you can select this and click on anywhere in your image that's supposed to be neutral. So in a photo like this, this was shot in Portland, Oregon, and if you've ever been to the Pacific Northwest, it's very rainy and very, very foggy or cloudy very often. Um, it rains an unbelievable amount in Portland and in Seattle. And we end up with a lot of days that look like this, where everything is pretty much flat and gray. So a photo, for a photo like this one, I can pretty much click on almost anywhere in this image in the background here because it's supposed to be neutral. It's supposed to be grayish. If you're working somewhere and you've got images that have more of a sky in the background and they've got less of this kind of boring flat gray background, look for buildings, look for concrete and stone. Uh, if you're taking photos of people out on the street and you're looking for something, try clicking on the sidewalk or on the building behind them if it was supposed to be kind of more of a neutral building. If you're taking pictures in a studio, it's very easy because you can always include a, a gray card or a white card to, to balance with. But for a photo like this one, all I need to do is just click on the water behind the subject. And it's going to remove that kind of horrible green cast. So we can take a look. This was our original image. This is what we started out with. And this is what we ended up with. Now, just in case that doesn't get you 100% of the way there, don't forget that these manual adjustments can be really important. So maybe this photo is just a little too blue. I'll take my temperature slider and move it over a little bit to the right. And then I'll take my tint slider and just pull away some of the magenta because it's a little strong. And that works just a bit better. So this eyedropper tool can be a good general starting point. And sometimes it's going to work at 100% and then other times it's going to work at 97%. And you got to do that last little 3% yourself. So don't be afraid of moving those temperature sliders until it looks right to your eye. And as long as your monitor that you're working on, the computer that you're working on, is color calibrated and you know it's a good monitor, then that color is going to end up looking really great. The last button that works really well here is the reduce vibrance on skin. And it's nice because it can pull some of the, the vibrancy in the image itself. It can pull it off of the skin. So if I take the vibrant slider and move it over to the right, one of the things that's going to happen is it's not only going to make her dress brighter, but it's also going to make her kind of orangish pale skin look really intense. So by clicking on that option, you'll see it's removing some of the saturation from her skin. And I can turn that on and off so you can really see the difference here. So that's the intensity of the color. And then when we reduce the vibrance, it pulls it away. Now, for an image like this one, one of the last things that I would probably do is just like we did before, use that perfect eraser to clean it up. And the perfect eraser can be used on things other than dust spots. So if you're working on a portrait, bra straps. If you're, you're, you're working with a female subject, one of the things that I always notice is sometimes if I'm working with a model and they have a bra, you can see their bra straps. Um, and so it's really good for that. It's good for removing zipper tags, like the one in this image here. It can just be kind of distracting. So by clicking and dragging, we can get rid of that. And it looks a little bit cleaner. You get a cleaner line there. Sometimes you end up with distractions in the background that can be really frustrating. So there's this building that's coming right on the bottom right hand corner, it's like coming right out of that bottom corner. And it's a little distracting. We want a much cleaner horizon line behind the subject. So we're just going to make our brush a little bit bigger. And we're just going to go through and remove that. 
And now there's less distraction on the bottom part of the image. We don't have that weird kind of tree and building that's right there. And just by clicking and dragging once or twice, we can completely remove it and we still get a nice line for where that ripple in the water is. I don't need to worry about it anymore. So use this across the board. It works great. If you need to clean up skin at all, I recommend using our retouch brush. The content aware fill can be a great option when you're working on images. Whoops. We don't want to erase her shoulder there. That would be bad. The perfect eraser is really great when you're working on images that have, for instance, larger areas that are difficult to remove. So that building that was down on the bottom there, that's really hard to remove. Um, the zipper tag was a little bit more difficult to remove just because it has a texture based dress that it's trying to replicate. But the retouch brush is great for softer gradients. It's good for skin tones and skies that you need to remove areas from that don't have a lot of hard edges. So for this image, if I wanted to clean up some of the freckles on her skin, maybe she didn't like all of them, I can go through and I can use this tool and just get rid of a couple of those. And it does a much better job of replicating a soft skin-like texture instead of using the hard-edged perfect eraser. What's also really nice about the retouch brush, and one of my favorite parts about using it on pictures of people, is if you go up to your tool options bar, where you're gonna find the size and the feathering of the brush itself, you can also lower the opacity. So I sometimes like to drop the opacity down to about 30 or 40, make my brush a little bit bigger, and I can soften areas of the skin just a little bit. So she has kind of a, a stain where her arm used to be and just by dragging over it a couple of times we're fading out that darker area on her underarm and it blends a little bit better with the rest of her skin now it's not quite so noticeable and you can use this to soften areas of shine maybe if they have a couple wrinkles underneath their eyes or maybe on their forehead and you want to soften those a little bit use this lower opacity retouch brush to add that kind of softer gradient effect now, just like before, once we're done, we'll go ahead and click Save and Close. It's going to apply the effects and it's going to pop us back into Perfect Browse. And we can take a look at our before and after. Just like with the last image, we've got our original and our after photos right next to each other. So we started out with this image here. Bad color correction, a couple of distracting little sections that we need to remove. And this was our after. Very, very simple, but very powerful adjustments. And if you're not talking through the thing, the uh, the presentation like I am, so if you don't talk to yourself while you're doing your photo editing, it probably can go just a little bit faster, which is really nice. So you've got a lot of these tools and they go very quickly. One of the reasons why Enhance is such a great program is because everything that you really need is kind of sandwiched into this one little section. Now let's talk about dull photos. This is one that it definitely plagues many people, myself included. I'm going to go ahead and click on Enhance, just like we did before. We'll edit our copy and click OK. Two of the sliders that we haven't really talked about yet in the color and tone adjustments are the whites and the blacks. And this Auto Levels button, we haven't really touched about what it is. This automatically sets the black and white points in your photo, which means that it sets a white point that's nice and bright. It sets a black point that gives you nice, dark, deep shadows. And it also gives the image a little bit more of an intense contrast to it. The two photos that we were just working on, we didn't really need to set auto levels. The first one was underexposed, so we ran into issues with that. The second one was of a portrait with a blown out background, so that doesn't really make sense. But for a photo like this one, that's just, it was shot on a slightly cloudy day. It was shot underneath an overhang, which is why there's that darker strip right up at the top there. That's because it was shot right underneath the overhang of a, a roof. But it's because it's basically in shadow and there isn't a lot of very intense light on this, it's everything is kind of in midtones. So the auto levels button is going to be very useful for an image like this. Go ahead and click on it once 
it brightens up the photo, but as you can see, it's maintaining a lot of deep dark shadows. You can always go down to the white and black sliders to adjust them manually too. So for instance, in this photo, let's say that I wanna push the white point up even more. I'll move that over to the right just enough. It brightens up the entire image. All those whites get a little bit brighter. And with the black slider, when I push it over to the right, we're just gonna add a little bit more intensity so that we're getting a stronger contrast. I like to use the level sliders, and this is just a, this is a little tidbit for when you're applying contrast to your image. I always like to go to the whites and the blacks to apply contrast, then to go straight up to the contrast slider itself. It increases and decreases global contrast, whereas these separate the white channel and the black channel. Because as you can see, we wanted to intensify the whites more than we did the blacks. The contrast slider doesn't give you the ability to separate those two down. So I always really like the option of going down here to apply contrast because it gives me more control. Now, for this photo here, I don't really need to change brightness or contrast. Don't really need to do shadow or highlight recovery because it's pretty well balanced. The only one that I really want to pump up is the detail slider because there's a lot of grit in this image that's being left kind of hazy and soft. And that's just kind of a digital haze that happens when you're taking images. And I think almost everybody's probably seen it before where they look at a photo in person, they look at it on their tiny screen and they're like, wow, look at all that detail. And then you put it on your computer and you're like, well, it kind of looks a little soft. Detail slider can come to the rescue, especially with, with images like this one, where we don't have a subject that is human or even animal. I, sometimes you can run into adding too much detail on animals too, because the, the fur is really fine. Because this is an inanimate object, adding a little extra detail is not a bad thing because it gives me a lot of grit and a lot of grime and I'm not worried about over detailing areas like skin. So be careful with how far you go because you can get really crazy, but just in case you want to, you can always push it really, really far. I'm gonna drop it down closer to about 30 or 40. That seems to be a good sweet spot for this image. Now, for the color section, all I'm gonna do is pump up the vibrance to make sure that those colors are nice and bright. I don't really need to change the color on this because I like that bluer haze. And then I wanna go down and add a customized vignette. We haven't really talked about some of the advanced options for vignetting, but this is a perfect photo to do that for. Because this was taken underneath a, a roof overhang, the top part of the image has a very, very dark area right along the edge, whereas the bottom part of the photo is obviously much lighter. And it's because this was brighter, it wasn't as underneath that overhang, so we're getting more sunlight that's hitting the bottom part of the image itself. When you apply a vignette, which I'm gonna go through and add a very basic one, and I'm gonna pull it in. When you apply a vignette, you'll notice that it's smack dab in the center of your photo. Now, this isn't gonna be your final vignette. I'm just using this so that I can show you guys kind of how this works. The vignettes are automatically placed in the center of the image. We actually have a tool here called the centering tool, and you'll find it on the bottom left-hand corner of the vignette pane. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on it, and you get a little crosshair that pops up. This gives you the ability to recenter the vignette wherever you want to. So for a photo like this one, we want to go through and we want to add a vignette to the image, but we want it to be applied more to the bottom and less to the top. So by taking the centering tool, we're just I'm just gonna move my mouse up a little bit. So this is probably close to where the center of the image is. So we'll scoot up just a tad and click, and it's pushing the vignette up. If it didn't work the first time, if you're not really happy with the result, you can always click higher, lower, left, right, wherever you want it to be. So you can click in multiple places, whether you want it to be a spotlight or on a certain part of your image, whether you just need to move it over a little bit to the left or right, anything that you wanna do, you can go in and you can scoot that vignette around. Now, one of the reasons why I dropped the size and the feathering down pretty low is so that I can figure out where the vignette's going to end up. 
once it's in place, that's when I'm going to go through and adjust things like the size, the feathering amount, the roundness. So I, I kind of like the roundness the way that it is. And then the style. The style drop down menu is how that darker overlay, which is technically what the vignette is, it's basically just a black overlay that's being placed on your image. It's how it's blending into your photo. My favorite option, and the one that I use almost all the time, is subtle because it's the most simple. Normal is just a plain black overlay and can be a little too in your face, a little too intense. And then soft adds this kind of high contrast, high vibrance to the colors. So subtle seems to be the one that I think works the best, and it's the one that I use the most often. So I'm just going to play around with that until it's set, and I'm pretty much good to go. Now for this image, we took the photo. I'm going to show you our before and after again. This is what we started out with. Really, really boring. This is what we ended up with just here in Perfect Enhance. We haven't done anything really advanced on this photo. We've just gone in and we've used a lot of these different options here and we've smart applied them to our image and made sure that we customized it for this photo. And that's really important. Now, now that we've actually gone through and we actually like our photo, <coughs> let's say that I want to take this and I want to get it ready to print. There's also a sharpening pane here. It's down on the bottom of all of these different panes, which I can go through and we'll close some of these up so you can see them all. So we've got our quick fixes, our color and tone adjustments, our vignette, and then down at the bottom, we haven't talked about it yet, our sharpening pane. What's wonderful about this is we do have some basic presets up at the top. So general print, general screen sharpening, and then fixing focus, which can take an image that looks a little hazy and make it appear a little bit more in focus. It will not take a blurry photo and make it look like it's in focus, but it can help take an image that's softer and pull away the haze. What I like to do is go down to the sharpen for dropdown menu, and you have a whole bunch of options here for how you'd like to sharpen your image. And what I like is the fact that I have the ability to choose, so I'm gonna print this image out. And I know I'm gonna print it on glossy paper because I really like high contrast, I like high detailed images on bright glossy paper. And I can choose whether I'd like to sharpen for a portrait, whether I'd like to sharpen a lot and have a lot of detail added to the image, or whether I'd like to have a low, very minimal amount of sharpening. So print glossy high, print glossy low, or print glossy portrait. I'm going to choose print glossy high, and we'll go ahead and select it. You're not going to notice much of a difference when you first look at the photo. So go up to the top right-hand corner of your screen and click inside your navigator. Click on this little 100. This zooms you in to 100%. And when you're adding sharpening, this is how you tell what kind of sharpening you're adding, and whether you think it looks good for your photo. So I'm going to turn this sharpening pane on and off so that now we can actually see the difference. This is our original image without any sharpening. This is with just a very small minimal amount. It's not a lot. It's a small change, just a little bit of crispness that's being applied to these like paint chipping areas of the image. If we want a little bit more, we can always move it over to the right and we can intensify it. But you should be very careful with how much sharpening you add because you can go overboard really, really quickly. Now let's go ahead and we're going to zoom back out. If you go up to your navigator and you click the fit button, it fits your image into screen so that you don't have to worry about zooming in and out at a weird size. And then just like before, we'll click save and close. It's going to add all these effects, and then it's going to bring us back into Browse just like it's done with all the other photos. Now, again, I want to show you guys that quick before and after just so you can really see the difference in these photos because this is one of my favorite to show. It's such a huge difference between the before and after. It's kind of unbelievable. This is our original photo. It is so boring and so flat. And this is our after photo.
That's a huge difference, which is the couple of basic tools. And it's got a little bit of sharpening on it now so I can prep it for print, which is really, really nice. All right, so in the last like five, 10 minutes, I wanna show you guys a little bit more of a fun styling technique that you can do inside Perfect Enhance. We've gone over all of the basics like fixing your image with things like detail and customized vignettes. We've talked about exposure and color correction. We've talked about portraits and a little bit of skin retouching, a little bit of vibrancy fixing on, on skin tones. But there are a lot of really fun things that you can do to your images. And I've got this photo here. And it's like one of the perfect examples for taking kind of a boring or bland photo and making it look a little fun. So we'll pop this into Enhance. We'll edit our copy. Now, sometimes you don't really know where to start with an image. Uh, this is a good example. I made this pie, blueberry peach. I love pie a lot. Um, if you know me in person, it's a little disturbing how much I love pie. So I take a lot of pictures of pies and cakes. I think I like pies more than cakes. So I sometimes end up with photos where um, I baked this on a, a late afternoon, and by the time that it was actually fully finished, I had cleaned off the top, the light had started to go, and I didn't have the lights at, at my apartment at the time. Um, they were at my studio, and so all I had was the dim light at the end of the day, which is not a lot, especially, again, if you live in the Pacific Northwest, don't have a ton of sunlight here. So I took this image very frantically so that I can have a photo of said pie, and it's pretty good, but it is a little boring in the grand scheme of things, which is totally fine. It's a picture of a pie, but I'd like to be able to show off my pie to lots of other people and make them jealous that I am an epic pie maker. So there's some presets that you can actually find on the left-hand side of your screen. And I'm gonna open up, you can make your own user presets of changes that you make on the right-hand side, but we also have some on-one presets. The top section is called corrections, and these are very simple. It's adding automatic level and color adjustments, just applying auto levels or auto colors, getting an image ready to print, which is basically auto levels, auto color, and basic sharpening. But the section that I really like is called enhancements, and these are a little bit more fun, if you will. There's a cool night effect, which I'm going to go ahead and click on so I can show it to you guys. It adds this almost like vampiric preset, which is fun. There's one called an HDR look, which isn't gonna work great on this image, but it's high detail, high highlight, high shadow recovery, which for this photo we don't really need, but you can see that the intensity of it is very important. We have some called our magic presets. These are really fun. One of my favorites is called magic landscape. And it adds this soft kind of warming filter to the image while brightening up all the whites and darkening the black so you get a high contrast look and it adds just a little bit of detail and then the last one down at the bottom that we can also apply is called vintage warm and it's a really fun kind of faux vintage style that you can add to your image here and enhance one of the other things that can also be really helpful if you've got an image again like this one that's a little flat it's a little boring um, while the subject is great because pie, who doesn't love pie, it could use a little bit more umph. So one of my favorite ways to do that is actually by cropping it down. We also have a crop tool here in Enhance. It's up at the top of your toolbox and you can select it and you can crop out your photo. And what I like to do is just trim it down so that it's a little bit more of a square and I think that that sometimes gives off more of a vintage style. It, I think it can look a little bit better if you've got an image like this one that's in the square. We're going to crop off all that excess that we don't need anyways. This isn't a fine art award-winning photo. I don't need to worry about, you know, when I show off my portfolio, this probably isn't going to be in it unless it's a pie portfolio and people are judging me on the epicness of my pies. This isn't going to go with my photo portfolio. So I don't need to worry about the fact that it's at a right size. It's rectangular. I don't need to worry about the fact that I'm cutting off all this excess information that I could use. I'm just going to crop it. So for me, that square format evokes a little bit more of a film style look, and I think it can be really fun for photos like this one. So when you add the crop to your image, go up to the top right hand corner and click the apply button so we can apply that change. 
It'll zoom in a little bit. And then I'm going to go up and we're going to play around with our color and tone adjustments. Now, I'm going to take my whites and my black sliders. We're going to make the whites a little bit lighter and the blacks just a little bit darker. We're going to take the detail slider and move it down a tad because we don't want to add too much detail. One of the big, really important things about detail, and I'm going to push this over really far, is that while it adds detail to the crisp areas of the image, like these lattice parts on the pie, the blueberries and peaches that you can see, it's also applying way too much detail to the soft, out of focus areas in your image. And that can make the, the photo look really, really fake and really bad. So be careful with detail on images that have a shallow depth of field. So I'm gonna take that detail slider and I'm gonna move it up just a tiny bit and leave it there. I'm also going to take my vibrant slider and we're going to pump it up a little bit more. We don't want to completely mute it all the way because I want to make sure that some of the colors from the original pie come through, but we don't want to go overboard because we don't want to make it look too fake. So I'm going to drop it down just a little bit. I can also push the temperature over and really warm the image up even more if I want to, but we're still getting that kind of like warm film, like Kodak, 400, like 35 millimeter look. It's got a little bit of grit and grain because it was shot at a really high ISO at the end of the day. So we don't need to worry about the fact that we get rid of the grain because it kind of works for this photo. The last thing that I'm going to do is just hone in on my vignette. I want to make sure that it's the right kind of vignette here. So I'll move my feathering down to zero. And then I'm just going to adjust the size and the roundness. And I want it to be more of like a rounded rectangle here. I really like that effect. So we'll go ahead and push that out and then we'll pump up the feathering amount and the brightness. There we go. Now this photo again, probably isn't gonna go up online or it's probably not gonna get printed out. So I don't need to worry about adding sharpening. I can add a little bit of screen sharpening, which sometimes can help when you place your images up online. You want to make sure you maintain some crispness. It's a very small amount that's very almost unnoticeable. Um, so I can add a little bit of sharpening. There isn't really anything I need to retouch in this image. Maybe if I wanted to clean up the, the wood on the, the table that I set this on, I could do it. But I'm okay with all those stains because I like it. Before I exit, I'm gonna save this as a preset so that I can remember it for next time. So to save a preset here, just go up to the preset dropdown menu and choose save preset. And this time we'll call it Liz's Vintage Warm. We took the original Vintage Warm preset. It was good, but didn't work great for this image. And we, I fixed it up and I made it look a little bit better for, for my own images. If you're like me, you may not have a category right away so you can actually add your own categories here in Enhance. So I'm gonna call these just Liz's Enhance Presets and click OK. And then I can type in a creator and a description if I'd like to. Those presets will be found in the User Presets section. We'll open that up. There's Liz's Enhance Presets and there's the one that we just applied. All right, so let's go ahead and click save and close for this last photo and we'll pop it into browse and we'll do a quick before and after. And then you can see the difference between our two images. So this was our original photo here. This was a raw file. It was actually straight out of camera. I have done nothing to it. Um, so very simple, very basic, like two seconds, put this out on a table on my back porch and shot it at the end of the day at a very high ISO. You can see ISO 1000 um, at uh, f-stop of 1.8. You can actually see your info panel here in Browse in the top left-hand corner. So this was our original photo, and this was our after. We fixed it up, made it look a little bit classier. I can place this up on my pie-making website because I make a lot of pie, and I take a lot of pictures of food. So I've got my pie photo. We took a boring, bland one that didn't really have a lot of information, and we gave it more of like a warm 1950s, like household steaming, steaming pie on the edge of the, on the edge of the window style. So it looks a little bit better and a little bit more interesting than the photo that we started out with.